Thank you very much, Gabby and Manny. Very well done. And uh, very hard to follow up with that one, I'll tell you. That was excellent. Thank you so much. Take your Bibles with me, your iPads, your phones, or whatever you're using, and turn with me to Psalms chapter 139, verses 1 through 10. A wonderful selection, Rondi. Outstanding. And so forth. So take time to open, the, open it up. Make sure I read it right. Psalms 139. Verses 1 through 10. I'm reading out of the NIV translation. I probably should have asked Ronnie which translation she would have preferred and so forth, but she said, it's okay. All right, so good. Psalms 139, 1 through 10. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. Wow. How would you like Jesus saying that to you, right? You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. Beautiful text, would you not read? Thank you, may the Lord bless the reading of his word. Good morning, everyone. I have to tell you, if you're not part of the Thunderbird Academy, you're missing something pretty great. Um, since yesterday morning, it's been one blessing after the other. We had chapel here in this room a um, little over 12, 12 hours ago, well, 24 hours ago, I should say, and the sophomore class brought our chapel to us, and it was an amazing blessing there. Um, and we had a young man who sang to us, and it, it just an astonishing way, he just filled this room. And then last night we had all the dorm students over to our house and Amelia gave us a real blessing in her talk. And I wanna thank you, Amelia, for that. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't believe in coincidences. Things happen and sometimes you go, what? And then you go, oh, I get it. Now this morning, I had no conversation with anyone about my sermon today except with my husband he knows the story because he lived it with me but no one else really knew what I was going to talk about and yet just about everything we've heard so far this morning falls into place Dan the songs that you chose couldn't have been more perfect in fact I like when the music supports what the sermon is and I'd even ask Lisa on the fly Thursday night, what are the songs for, the, for Sabbath morning? And she showed me the list, and I just looked at them, and I thought, oh, maybe. But I hadn't taken the time to actually read the words to it. The order that you gave it in, Dan, perfect. I'm going to have you guys see what you think as you hear the story that I'm going to share with you and see if you know and can see how our music set us up for for this, what I want to share with you today. And I do want to say that I love story too, and I love history, but I also love contemporary story. And what I have to share with you today is a story that happened to me just about three months ago. So a kind of in time story. It was a glorious day for a road trip. Sunny, not too hot, a carless road ahead of us, and the whole day to accomplish it. Our destination, Salt Lake City, and an event that has been on my bus bucket list since I was a young child, when the mellifluous sounds of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir would fill our home Friday nights and Sabbath afternoons. Yes, I've always, always wanted to hear that Mormon Tabernacle Choir live, and this past summer was our opportunity. As many of you know by now, Mr. Reynolds, my husband, and I love taking road trips. We've logged tens of thousands of miles. 
all across the country over the past five years. Uh, all through Arizona and California, all the way to northern New England, all the way down to Florida and across to Texas and many states in between. We try to give ourselves plenty of time because we know we're never going to go from here to there without stopping. We know that we are going to take detours and side trips. Uh, we know this, so we try to give ourselves plenty of time. And as a result, our trips take sometimes twice as long as they should, and maybe even longer. Um, this day, we gave ourselves plenty of time to reach our destination. It was a historic bed and breakfast about 10 miles outside of downtown Salt Lake City. But as usual, we found ourselves taking little side trips along the way, stopping, for example, at the childhood home of um, Butch Cassidy, as well as several other scenic and historic markers that said, stop, we have to, you have to see us. What should have taken us under 10 hours took us over 12 hours. So by the time that we arrived, it was late in the night, and our hostess very graciously was still awake, waiting for us. Even so, she took the time to take us through her, her home. She didn't have any other guests that night, so she took us around and showed her, her husband. She and her husband had um, retrofitted this over a century-year-old home as a bed and breakfast. So she took us all around and showed us, and we were duly impressed. She did say that we were the only guests there, so um, we could choose our time for breakfast, so we didn't choose a very early time, of course. <laughs> when we went down in the morning, everything was ready for us, and it was a delicious meal. She had fixed something vegetarian for us, uh, and she apologized, said, I don't know too much about making vegetarian food, but I did my best, and it was very good. Uh, and because no one else was there, she sat with us, and um, she said, would you like to hear the story of the house? And we, of course, love stories, so we said, please, tell us the story. So she did, and it's a story. It's an immigration story. Um, her husband's ancestors had come over and eventually found their way to this town, Sandy, Sandy something, Sandy, anyway, just outside of Salt Lake City, and had built this home. And um, so it was an interesting story, and we really enjoyed it, and we thanked her profusely when we finished um, with our breakfast and when she finished with our story, and we went on our way the rest of the day. We toured around Salt Lake City and filled our, ourselves with more stories about this iconic city. Um, we even got in on a mini concert with legendary Mormon Tabernacle Choir organist Richard Elliott and had the opportunity to talk with him afterwards and make some connections there, which was pretty thrilling. And then that night, we joined 22,000 other people in the conference center for the Pioneer Day concert with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. They had a special guest, it was a Norwegian singer, and which was especially exciting to me because my father's Norwegian and this was one of his favorite singers, and I was sad he wasn't able to hear it with me, but all the same, it was a powerful story, and that in itself I don't have time to tell you, but if you want to hear it, I can share it with you some other time. But that in itself had a beautiful testimony as well. But that's really not what I want to share with you today. That's all the prelude to the real story. Um, when we got home from that concert, Fran, our hostess, told us that she did have guests for the night and there would be somebody else there in the morning. So we were prepared when we went down that morning for somebody to be there, and it was a young couple, and we ate breakfast with them and we enjoyed getting to know them and then towards the end as we were just finishing up Fran came in and she said to them would you like to hear the story of the house and they said oh yes and then she apologized to Mr. Reynolds and me and we said don't worry it's a good story we don't mind hearing it again so she shared with them and we were all again exclaiming how interesting it's a very cool story and then as she was saying there at the end um, about how 100 years after the house was built, she said, my husband and Ed, Ed and I bought it. I've lived here for 30 years now, 20 as the B&B &B hostess. And as I was hearing her say that for the second time, it occurred to me, there's a story here. So I asked her, I said, what's your story? What's your story? 
how did you and your husband meet and come together to um, create this bed and breakfast? And she looked at me, and then she looked at the others, and she said, do you want to hear it? And we're like, oh, yeah, yes, we do. So she settled in and told her story. It's a story I'm pretty sure she would never have guessed I'd be sharing with you all three months later. But I think it's a story worth sharing, so here it is. Fran got married at a young age and had children early on. Years passed. She thought her life was going well, typical family issues with kids and all, but nothing major. And then one day her husband came home and said, sorry, Fran, I don't love you anymore. I'm leaving. And she was like, what? She was shocked. She basically had no clue what was, had gone wrong. She, of course, begged him to stay. She said, tell me, what can I do? I'll do anything. Stay for the children's sake. But he would not be deterred. And he left. She was devastated, demoralized even. At first, she turned to God, begging him to bring her husband back. When the days and weeks passed and her husband didn't come back, she got angry. She was angry at everyone and everything, but especially God. She stopped going to church, she stopped going out with her friends, stopped taking herself, taking care of herself. Everything that made up her life was painful and she didn't want to have anything to do with it. Nothing that would remind her of her husband or her life with him. In truth, she didn't even want to live. She plodded on, but was virtually on the edge of giving up at any given moment. Then one night, she woke up crying she spent the next hour sobbing and yelling at God. Do you even know me? She cried. Give me a sign. Give me a sign that you know me, even just a little. She threw herself down on her knees and kept repeating, give me a sign. Give me a sign. As she heard herself say that, she thought, this is ridiculous. I'm not important enough to God to, to give me a sign. He doesn't care about me. Never mind, he's not going to take the time to let me know that he does. He's not going to answer me. He definitely does not know me. And yet she stayed there on her knees and waited. And waited. And just when she was about to give up, she thought she heard something. Her name. Fran. Fran. What? Was that someone calling her name? Her heart was pounding, and she held her breath, hoping it had just been her imagination. Fran, there it was again. But who was it? Who could it be? Her son, Jack, by now the only child still living at home, he was upstairs sound asleep. There was no one else in the house. At least she didn't think so. Fran, go to church tomorrow. Wow, that was crazy. She hadn't been to church for quite a while now, and she wasn't about to go back just because a voice she heard in the middle of the night had told her to go. Besides, she looked a wreck. She had no idea what to do to fix herself up. She didn't think she had anything to wear. Fran, fix yourself up. Put on your blue dress and go to church tomorrow. Well, that was pretty specific, but still too bizarre to believe. There was no going back to sleep after that, so she just lay in bed wondering, maybe I should go. What if I gave it a try? But in the morning, in the clear light of day, it still seemed as if she might have truly lost her mind. If she actually did go to church, what would she say to anyone who asked her what had brought her back? A voice in the middle of the night? God? Slowly, because she couldn't help but question her sanity even now, she got dressed. She fixed her hair, put on her blue dress, and dragged her heels about getting herself out the door and to the church. But she finally did. She finally walked up to the steps, dragged open the door, and snuck in and slipped into the back pew, eyes down, not wanting to catch anyone's attention, certainly not, even, not wanting to see if anyone was going, like, what's she doing here? just kept her head down. I don't know a lot about more, how Mormons do their Sunday lessons, but apparently they have their lessons on a rotation. And at least in Fran's church, that's how it worked. 
and they have one person teaches a particular lesson, and then another one teaches another one, and it's in a specific order. And so because she had gone to church for a long time, even though she hadn't been there recently, she knew what the lesson was supposed to be that day, and she fully expected to hear that. So she's sitting there in the pew, her head down, ready to hear the lesson that, that it was supposed to be that day. And she heard a whole different voice. She heard the voice of her favorite teacher, in fact. Not only that, but it was her favorite lesson. Not planned for that day. It was not supposed to be that lesson. It was not supposed to be that teacher. And she's like, why, why am I hearing this? But because it was her favorite lesson, she listened. And as she's listening, she was like, wow, I'm really glad I came to church today. I needed this lesson. I needed to hear this. The lesson finishes. She gets up and she goes to the church, the sanctuary. She, again, sits in the back because she still doesn't want to meet anyone's eyes. She sits down. This time she goes to the middle of the, the, middle of the aisle so nobody's going to crawl over her. Nobody's going to bother her. Nobody's going to say, hey, why are you here? It's good to see you, whatever. So she's sitting there, eyes down, waiting for the service to start. And she hears somebody coming into the edge of her pew. And she's like, stay there, stay away, stay away from me. And wouldn't you know, they came all the way over to the middle and, and sat down next to her. Not only that, but as they're sitting down, they bumped her. That was a little irritating to her. So she kind of throws a not very nice look at that person. Didn't look at them, but just kind of looks that way to let them know she was not happy they had invaded her space. And then she moved. She moved down so she was not sitting next to them. Well, what do you know? But that person slid over and sat next to her and bumped her arm again. And she's like, what is this? And she gives a, another look saying, get away from me. And she moved again. But by now she's at the end of the pew. That person, again, moved to the end of the pew and this time really jabbed her in the arm. So she turned to say, stay away from me. And it was somebody that had been one of her best friends, but who had moved away about five years ago. And she hadn't seen them and really hadn't been in touch with them. And she's like, what? What are you doing here? And she kind of looked around and saw that his kids were there too. She noticed that his wife wasn't there, but the service was starting now, so she's like, oh, I better pay attention. So she's sitting there. They're not talking to each other. He's sitting there, and his kids are there. And she's trying to wrap her head around everything that's happened to her so far. God wakes her up, basically, in the middle of the night, says, you need to go to church. You need to wear your, your blue dress. You need to fix yourself up. When she gets to the church, she hears a lesson. She's not prepared, but it's her favorite lesson and her favorite teacher. And then she wants to be all by herself in that pew, and somebody keeps invading her privacy, and then it turns out to be a very dear friend of hers. And she's like, this is really strange, but, but I'm glad I came. As she's pondering over all of that, she hears a voice start to sing, and it's the special music. And she looks up, and it's one of her favorite singers from the church singing. And they're singing a song that normally you wouldn't hear in a church service. Not exactly inappropriate secular necessarily, but just wasn't what you would normally hear in a church service. And yet, it was exactly what she needed to hear. Um, she sat there, and she listens to the music, and it's just filling her soul, and she starts to cry. Tears are rolling down her cheeks by now. Um, and she's like, no, this isn't happening, this isn't happening. And yet she keeps listening, and of course it's really stirring and moving her heart. When the music was done, she's sitting there now going, I don't know what's happening here, what is going on? And so she's starting to think, and she's like, this all is not a coincidence. This was not just a random voice I heard in the middle of the night. Clearly God wants something from, from me and for me. So she's sitting there. Um, thinking about all of this unexpected blessings um, from that experience. Well, when the church service ended, she did what any good church member would do, and she turns to her friend and says, do you have any plans for lunch today? Madly thinking, do I have anything in the house I haven't cooked for forever? 
Um, what would I do? What would I do? Do I have enough for his family? There were like three kids. Um, so she's <laughs> thinking maybe he should just say no, say no. But he was like, no, we have no plans. We'd be happy to come. So she's like, okay, let me go home and fix something. So she leaves. She goes home, collects her son, goes home, and she starts scrambling for food. And she cooks up everything that she could think of that she thought would be good. Meanwhile, her son comes downstairs and says, Mom, can I go to my friend's house? They're asking me to go. She's like, no, you have to stay here um, to, to help entertain the, my friend's kids. And he's like, no, no, this friend never asked me over. It's my first chance in a long time. Please, please, please. And so finally she said, all right, go. You know, you know how that goes sometimes, don't you? So he goes off, and now it's just her. Well, now she's saying, how am I going to explain the fact that it's just me here, that my husband's not here, my son's not here. Why in the world did I invite somebody over just me? Finally, the doorbell rings. She goes to the door expecting to see Ed and his wife and kids, and it's just Ed. And she's like, where are your kids? Where's your wife? And he just looked at her and said, well, my kids wanted to go with their friends. And she's like, ah, I get that. That happened to me too. And then she said, and your wife? And he said, well, my wife's been gone for a while. And then she said, me too. And then they look at each other and then they said, now what? <laughs> it felt a little awkward all of a sudden. So she said, well, I have a mountain of food in there. Somebody needs to eat it. Come on in. So he came in and they sat down in front of a mountain of food and tried to make their way through it. But as you might guess by now, way leads on to way and there was more talk than eating. And they talked until way into the night. Um, turns out, well, she knew this about him, but for, for you guys, turns out he was a, a psychologist. Um, a professor of psychology, and he had been invited um, by the University of, of Utah there in Salt Lake City to come from the University of Colorado, where he te taught, to come and teach for a, a semester. So he was there for the semester, which is why, and that answered one question as to why was he even there. Um, so he was there for this whole semester. And um, they talked about their losses, and she talked, and she shared her story about how she had been so angry with God and she didn't know what to do with herself and then this voice had said go to church and how she had grudgingly finally got herself there and how all these blessings had come to her because she had listened to that voice and finally it was t he had he had to leave because her her she had a son and he had kids and they needed to take care of their kids so when he left, he just said, Fran, anytime, here's my phone number. He says, anytime you need to talk, just give me a call. Um, and so he left. And of course, there's no sleeping that night. She lay there in bed, reviewing everything that had happened over the past 24 hours. She thought especially of the words that she had literally yelled at God the night before. You don't even know me, she had said to him. Give me a sign. Give me a sign. Now I ask you, did he know her? Did he give her a sign? Or two, or three, or a whole afternoon full of signs that he knew her? He knew exactly what she needed. He knew her favorite dress. He knew her favorite lesson, her favorite teacher a song that she needed to hear, a friend she needed to reconnect with, um, someone who would in fact change her life for the better in years ahead because you see the rest of the story is, and I know you've already guessed it, um, the next day she couldn't get that afternoon out of her head. She kept thinking about him, kept thinking about him, and she's like, I, I want to talk to him, but no, I can't do that. You know how that goes, too, probably. <laughs> Not going to call him. So all day long, she kept saying, no, no, no. Finally, that evening, she's like, ah, I have to talk to him. So she called him up. And she is, of course, scrambling with a logical reason to call him, some kind of problem or something, you know, a real reason to call. But eventually, it just came out that she just 
wanted to talk with him. And they talked for a few hours. Um, and this then became an everyday thing. They either talked with each other or saw each other every day until one day he said to her, Fran, the semester's ending. I have to go back to my real job in Colorado. And of course, they were both sad, but he had to leave and they just said, well, we'll keep in touch. Um, what had really happened there, of course, was that they had fallen in love over the course of all those conversations. And um, by the time he got back home to Denver, they were spending a lot of time on the phone. Well, it wasn't such a big deal when they were local, but now, and yes, it was that long ago where you had to pay for a long distance. Now they're long distance talking a couple hours every night. And she said to us, we literally couldn't afford to keep calling each other. So we got married. <laughs> and that's exactly what we said. We're just like, oh, wow, that's so beautiful. And they were married and they had a great life together um, serving. She went back to church. She went back to working for the church. And she said that she met so many people and she was able to, to share her love for God with so many people. And she had this great joy in her heart because she knew she knew that God knew her and that he loved her, and she knew that she could share that story with so many others. Um, she's been alone now for about a decade. Her husband, Ed, um, died uh, with complications from a stroke. And um, she spends her time now primarily operating the bed and breakfast they have and meeting people, and that helps her feel less lonely, she said. She's always glad when there are people in the house, and she always has a story to tell them. She doesn't always share that story with everyone. She says, I, I don't want to force it on anyone. She'll tell the house story. But then, if she sees that somebody's open to hearing the real story, she shares it with them. And I'm so glad that she did share that story that morning when she said, do you really want to hear it? Uh, we didn't know what it was going to be, but I'm so thankful the fact that God knew her so intimately, who she was, what she'd gone through, exactly what she needed and when, was a powerful testimony to me and to Tom. And we talk, we've talked about it many times since then. Three months have gone by and I'm still under the power of that story. I still keep thinking, God knows me. He loves me, he knows what I need, when I need it. Um, and it's down to the minutest things, the things that in the grand scheme of things don't matter. I mean, he doesn't care what my favorite dress is or whatever. He doesn't care about that. And yeah, he does. He knows it enough to um, and use it to understand me. And I know that he does the same for you. That's the thing. He knows us so well. He knows how many hairs we have on our head or not. Uh, he knows us before we're even born. He says, before I knew you, I mean, before you, you, before you were born, I knew you. He tells us that. He knows when we need to let the testimony of others inspire and encourage us to renew our own relationship with him. Now, our friend Chuck over here shared my favorite Psalm 139 with you. Um, and he read from the NIV. I want to share it with you from the New Century Version. It goes like this. Lord, you have examined me and know all about me. You know when I sit down and when I get up. You know my thoughts before I think them. You know where I go and where I lie down. You know everything I do. Lord, even before I say a word, you already know it. You are all around me, in front and in back, and have put your hand on me. Your knowledge is amazing to me. It is more than I can understand. Where can I go to get away from your spirit? When can I run from you? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I lie down in the grave, you are there. If I rise with the sun in the east and settle in the west by the sea, even there you will guide me. With your right hand, you will hold me. This summer, friends' testimony reminded Tom and me that the psalmist God is not a lot of talk. He's a whole lot more than that. He is action, 
full of action. He does what he says he will do. He is with us and for us, behind us, and beside us. He knows what we need long before we realize that what we need is him. He's ready and waiting for us to finally say the word. Once we do that, he will shower us with evidence of his knowledge of and love for us. We will never, ever have to ask, God, do you even know me? The evidence will speak for itself. Now, because I started with Dan's opening song and talking about how that's not a coincidence, let me just read that. I hadn't planned that because I didn't know it was going to be part of our sermon today, but I want to end with the song that we started here with. Um, it's, it's Psalm, I mean, hymn 181, Does Jesus Care? Isn't that interesting? Because that was the question. And this is how it goes. Does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for mirth and song? As the burdens press and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long? Oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. Does Jesus care when my way is dark with a nameless dread and fear? As the daylight fades into deep night shades, does he care enough to be near? Oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares.